All right, today we will talk about the first section, uh, chapter four, exponential and logarithmic. Functions. And uh, the first section we will be talking about will be the exponential function. Okay? So, where does it come from? The first thing that came to my mind is something called the compound interest. Which actually is a very natural thought. So, suppose. You know, you have some extra money. You have a thousand dollar. Then you decided, I'm not going to use this money, and I don't want this money to sit there and without change. I want that thing to gain some, gain me some uh, interest. So what you do is you put it into the bank. Okay, let's assume it gives you ten percent of your a thousand principal, which is a uh, hundred dollar as interest per year. So you gain a hundred dollar. Okay, now in total you have. Eleven hundred, which is a thousand principal plus a uh, hundred interest. So far, so good. And if you want to take the money out after one year, you got eleven hundred. You gained this much interest. Now, what you want to do is actually, I'm not going to use this money soon. So even after the first year, I decided to put it for another year. And because you don't need this a thousand dollar, you also don't need this uh, additional a hundred dollar. And it will be even more beneficial if you put this one also into your principal. That is, you put everything you earned, including the principal and the interest from the first year, to let it sit there for a second year, to gain some additional interest. So what happened? You basically take your principal. Okay, you earn some interest, which is a hundred dollar, and then you put the principal and this a hundred interest to be the second year's principal. So basically, you keep the money in the bank for several years, say five or ten years. But every year, after you earn the interest, you reinvest your interest back into your principal. Okay, and that is the idea—the idea of reinvestment, reinvestment, interest into the principal. And that is called the idea of compound interest. Okay, it's very common. If you have some free money, just let it sit there for enough years, and you keep the principal there. You also don't take out the interest, so the interest end up going into your principal for the next round. Okay, so now let's try to comp compute how much money you can make according to this compound interest. So let's say you take a thousand dollar. We call it the principal. Okay, let's say you have an annual rate. Which is ten percent for easy of computation. Now let's calculate how much money can you get after the first, second, third, until the fifth year okay, using compound interest. Okay, so the first year, a thousand principal in. Um, that's year zero. So let's take a table. Year zero, your. Uh, principal and your interest. Okay, so the first year you have a thousand principal, you got a hundred percent, uh, a ten percent, so which is a hundred dollar. Okay, which is a thousand times ten percent. Together, you got a thousand plus a thousand times ten percent, which is roughly eleven hundred dollar, and you put it into the second year. So for the second year, year one, what you end up is you have eleven hundred. Your interest is going to be eleven hundred times ten percent. You end up with eleven hundred, okay, plus eleven hundred times ten percent, which is one ten, okay, which equals twelve ten. Now what you're going to do is keep doing the same thing. For the next year, you put twelve ten. You have twelve ten times ten percent, which is the compound interest. Your interest goes into your principal. Your principal keeps increasing. After that, you have a hundred and ten plus a hundred twenty-one, which gave you one three three one, and you keep going like this. 
I think the fourth year is fine. Okay, we don't have to keep going. I think you get what I mean. Just one, uh, four, six, four point one. Keep going. You can see the number gets a little bit tricky. So this is how this one is going to gain. I think everybody follows the process. Now my question is, what will happen after ten years, or moreover, what will happen even after a hundred years? One thing you can do is you can take this procedure and, and just repeat it for ninety-nine times. But of course, for efficiency, we are looking for a general formula. Hopefully, this formula will be so easy such that if we put in a number of years, like ten years, a hundred years, we will get the final answer within one calculation. So that's our goal. We are looking for a, a easy formula for for t years. Then we can plug in t equals ten for ten years, t equals a hundred, and so on. Okay. So now let's see how we compute this number. Let's take a to be our money after ten years, uh, t years. Okay. So. What will be a if t equals one? Well, it's going to be a thousand, your principal, plus a thousand times ten percent, which is eleven hundred. But let's just keep it away. Don't simplify it to get the actual number. We want to see the pattern here. That's for one year. Okay. Now for two year. Well, we're going to take this whatever we have here. That's from the last year, which will, the, will be the principal plus plus what we have here at a ten percent of that. So this one itself plus plus another ten percent, which will equals. Well, let's simplify a little bit. You see, even though we have this, we have this part and this part to be the common factor. So what we can do is we can take these two and factor them out. Which is from the last year, actually. Which is exactly what's from the last year. Here. Okay. Then there is a one. There is a ten percent. We factor it out. So together, it's one plus ten percent. And from here, you can see these two are actually the same rate. Which give you a thousand times times one ten. For twice, which means take the square. Now you can repeat this process for the next year. What are you going to do? What you will be doing is you will take this one, pretend it's a single number, do it, plus this one, times ten percent, for the interest. Again, this one and itself become the common factor, and then you will multiply another one plus principal plus the interest. Which is another same factor as this. So we have a thousand, one ten, to the cube. Now you can make a guess, or you can actually see this procedure works just as this way. So keep going. You will have for the t years. For each year, you multiply this rate, which is one a hundred percent plus another ten percent at interest. Okay. For once, for t years, you just do it for t times. So finally. Your a is going to be a thousand. This percent, four, four for t times. For one year, you do it for twice, uh, once. For two years, you do it for a square. For three years, you do it for a cube. You just keep going. Now, what about a hundred years? You just plug in t equals a hundred, and you can easily take out a calculator and try to see it. So, for example, a hundred years. You can simply take a thousand times one point one, technically, to the hundred points. And then we just take a calculator. Oh, that's roughly what he got. Wow, wow, that's a lot of money. Uh, it's a、uh, thousand dollar become one three seven eight. Dollar. So which means a thousand dollar becomes. Roughly thirteen million dollars within a hundred years. From from here, you can see compound interest or exponential growth in general is very very fast. Of course, ten percent is not realistic in real life, but still, if you keep it for long enough, this one grows really fast. Okay, so that's the rough 
example of how to do compound interest for a special idea. But now let's summarize this one because our principal doesn't have to be a thousand dollar. It can be any dollar. So let's give them names. We call the principal for P dollar. P for principal. It can be a thousand, five thousand, four thousand. All the all of them actually work the same way. Okay. Now let let our A still be the money after two years. And let T to be number of years. And of course, we still, still need to know the annual rate. 10% we took for here. Usually, if you go to the bank, and they may give you 0.5%, I think, if you go to a regular bank for some um, a checking account. And maybe for a good one, you can get some 2.3% or things like that. Okay. Finally, we need one more thing. That is number of compounds per year. which is very easy to, easy to understand. So let's think about this case. Compounds a year. Compound interest. A year. Okay. So what do you mean by that? Well, we said the annual rate is 10%. That means starting from January the 1st. Okay. You will not get an interest until until um, December the 31st. Okay. Once you go past the December 31st, that means you have a full year. I give you 10%. That's my annual rate. That means if you actually keep this thing for a whole year, I give you the interest. And if, even if it's like just the 364 days, you will receive nothing. Of course, people don't like that, right? So they say, well, can we just compound more times a year? For example, let's just calculate our interest every season. Okay, that means seasonally, I compound four times a year. One at the end of March, one at the end of June, one at the end of September, and finally one at December. Okay, or I can do it monthly, which means 12 times a year. I can even do daily. I can do it even do it minutely, which means every minute my thing got compounded. Okay, that would be which way more uh, flexible. That means I can withdraw any time. I still got my interest that I deserve, right? Until, unless uh, not like if you you will get nothing until you do a three hundred three hundred a full of three hundred and sixty five years, a uh, days. Okay. So that is more flexible. But now, the, how do we compute that? Well, we need two things. Let's take seasonal as example. Four times a year. That means you need to take your principal. You need to times one, the principal, plus the interest for that season. So how many times do you want to do per year? You need to do it for four times a year. Okay. Now, what the rate should you put here? Number one, you cannot put the annual rate. If the annual rate is 10%, your seasonal rate cannot be 10%. Okay, otherwise, fourth season will be the same as four years, right? So instead, you should take the annual rate and reduce it by a factor of how many times it's compounded. For example, if your annual rate is 10% and you do it seasonally, which means four times a year, then each season you should have 2.5%, which is four out of 10. Okay, so that will be what you get from a year. If you compound it four times a year, with the annual rate divided by four, which is your seasonal rate. And if you want to do it for 12 times a year, which is easy, you just take the annual rate, divide it by 12, you got the monthly rate, and you do it for 12 months a year. What about two years? 24 times. Three years? Uh, 36 times. Three years and a half, you can calculate how much months you have. So basically what you need to do is just take 12 times times number of years. Okay. If you use anything other than annually, Okay, so that's the final setup. Let's take these four things, or these five things. Let's copy it. Let's paste it here. Ooh. And now we have the final formula for compound interest. Okay, 
that is let's see that is the principal compounded for 1 plus r over n, the annual rate divided by n. If n equals 1, it's the annual rate. n equals 4, it's the seasonal rate. 4, this is many times a year. Finally, times number of years. That equals to your final money you will receive from compound interest. That's the formula. Okay. This will be the first big formula we need for this section. All right, let's try to see an example. Very easy. Let's take a uh, $1,000, put it in the bank with a 12% annual rate. Okay, and then we want to save it for five years. Now let's calculate. How much money are you going to receive if you do it seasonally? And then let's calculate. What if we do the same thing, but this time it's compounded monthly? Now, we just apply the former. How we got the former? We did it for once. Now we can just use it. For seasonally, okay, we do it for $1,000 for the principal. 12% per year divided by 4. That's 3% per season. 4 seasons a year times 5 years. So that's 20 seasons in total. For our class, you can stop here. But if you're doing web work, you may very well take the calculator and just, you know, calculate the number. So that's going to be a thousand times 1.03 to the 20, which gives you 18.6, roughly. Okay, so take 12%, uh, you do it seasonally. After five years, you almost doubled everything. Okay, 1,000 become 1,800.6. All right, now let's do the monthly formula. Very easy to do. But instead of four, you do it for 12. 12 months for a year, for s five years, that's gonna be 12 times five, which is 60 months in five years. Note, this is not 0.3 anymore. That was the seasonal rate. This is the monthly rate. Okay. You have a lower rate, but you compound for more times. Before we go ahead and do it, okay. before we go ahead and do it, find it the number. Do you think it's going to be bigger than 1806, or is it going to be less than 1806? Pause the video and think about it. Using the same rate, the more times you compound, do you receive more money? Number one, you do compound more times, so that's an advantage. Meanwhile, you do compound with a lower rate, that's a disadvantage. So which one has a bigger benefit? Think about it, and let's calculate the number. Lower rate for 60 months. That's 18.16. Six. So according to what the we just did, okay, it's more than seasonally. Does it match your answer? Also, it's only ten dollar more, roughly ten, eleven dollar more than monthly. So this one has an advantage. Meanwhile, not much. All right, that's everything we have for compound interest. This one formula, and also what it means to set up a compound interest.
Okay. Now the second thing is we want to take what we had for compound interest and try to see does it apply to something else other than finance. Then we see something called the exponential function. Now take this one and take a look at it. Do you notice this is basically a formula? Okay. Everything here is a number. So it's in the format of in the format of A times B T, where A and B are numbers. Okay. What it represent, for example, if we take two times three to the T, or X, same thing. It represents two times three times three times three times three for many, many, many times. How many times depend really depends on what functions values do you put here for your x. And as far as we can see for compound interest, this is a very convenient function, which means multiplying the same number for multiple times. We give it a name, we call it the exponential function. So, the formula looks like this, a times b to the x. Here, a is called the initial value, like the principal. Okay, and uh, your b, okay, initial value. Your b is called the base of the exponent, okay? With some restrictions. Number one, b is bigger than zero. Number two, b cannot equal one. Okay? For example, this is an exponential function, two times three to the x. This is an exponential function, 1.1 to the x. From here you can see it's nothing but uh, a power. Pay close attention to what we had before for powers. We know this, we call this a polynomial or power function. Okay. Notice what we have here is basically the same format, but x is not at the base, x is at the exponent, so this is called exponential. They are very, very different. Okay. The one on the bottom is way faster, way bigger, for bigger x. All right. Now, several comments we want to make. Number one, we do know what we mean by three to the four, right? That basically means three times three for four times. That is easy. But we also know that sometimes we have some fractions if we put here. For example, three to the one half. Try to recall, that means the root, okay? So three to the one half is this. Four to the one third is going to be the cube root of four. So fraction means root. Let's go a little bit further. What do you mean by three to the three half? Number one, you have a power. Number two, you have a root. So what you can do is you can actually do the power and then take the root. Or you can do the root and then take the power. Doesn't really matter which way you do because eventually this all of them equals three to the one half to the cube or three to the cube to the one half according to the properties of exponents. So either way, it's, it's working. Lastly, you need to ask yourself, what do you mean by three to the negative one? Okay. Hopefully you remember, that's basically the reciprocal of your exponent. So three to the negative one is one third. Two to the negative four is going to be, you have the negative one, you have a four. Let's handle the negative one first. Keep the four and finally it's going to be one to the two to the four, which is one over 16. Okay, so now your exponents can be anything. That's the first comment. Second comment, we do have the restriction. The restriction is b is going to be bigger than zero and b is going to be not one. Why? Well, what if b equals one? Then you have y equals one to the x, which is one to any x is going to be one. Therefore, this one is going to be a horizontal constant function. So b equals 1 is legit. It's just it's not exponential. It's a constant. So that's why we remove it 
Otherwise, it's something way simpler than exponential. Now you need to ask yourself: B cannot be negative. Why is that? Let's again con consider b to the x, and let's plug in one half. Remember, we can plug in x for anything, so we can actually have one. which means the square root. Now recall what you know about square root. Can you take the square root of a negative 3 or anything negative? Well, if you're th only thinking about real numbers, it's impossible. So you cannot take the square root of anything which is negative. So here's the trade-off. If you can let b to be negative, then you need to tell people your x cannot be 1 half otherwise undefined, or your x cannot be 1 fourth, otherwise undefined, because it's the fourth root, sixth root. You can see you need, to, you need to exclude all these numbers you can plug in, if you allow to b to be negative. That's why I say, well, let's save the trouble. Let's just restrict b has to be positive. So any x you plug in, no matter it's a 1 third, it's a 1 fourth, it's fine. That's the reason why we want this one to be bigger than 0 and not equals 1. No special reasons, just, just it's easier to classify, to, uh, to handle. All right, number two, why is it useful? Well, we kind of talked about it. b to the x gives you something like b times b times b times b times b, right? So nothing actually works for anything that grow or decay at a certain percent. At a certain percent. Let me see the difference. Something we, very, we are very familiar, familiar with is actually something called linear. Okay, uh, That is growth or decay at a certain amount. For example, if you go to the gas station. Okay, you go to the gas station. You start with zero dollar. For every one more gallon you put in, you add two dollar. So what's F1? $2, then $4, then $6, then $8, then $10. Can you see? Every time you grow, you grow by a fixed amount. Even if you already spent $10,000 on that, you buy another gallon, it's still $10,000 plus 2. This amount is fixed for your growth. That's what we call a linear. Now let's see exponential, which will be quite different. Exponential grows at a certain percentage. That means if you're at a 2 and you grow by 10%, that's going to give you 2.2. You grow by 0.2. But if you're at 2,000, you grow by 10%. That's going to be 200. They give you 2,200. Now compare these two. You are not growing at the same amount. Instead, you're growing at the same proportion compared to what your current values are. That's the major difference of growing at a certain percentage. And now you need to think about in real life. What kind of things grow or decay at the percentage, not a fixed amount, but a fixed percentage? The more, the faster. Okay. At least we know several things grow like that way. The first one is compound interest in finance, of course. And what do you mean by that? That means any loan you apply for is a compound interest, and therefore it grows exponentially, not linearly. Okay, the more you get, the more interest you pay in amount, even though it's the same rate. Mortgage. Okay, inflation. You print money. Okay, so that's exponential growth. Second thing, population. Let's say we had two countries. They have the same birth rate. One country has 100 million people. The other country has 10,000 people. Even though you have the same birth rate and death rate, same rate, but this one certainly gives you more newborns than this one because they have a bigger base number. Okay, so population certainly grows this way. And when I say population, I didn't say any kind of, I didn't say which type of population. So basically any population will work. Number one, population for human being. 
it will work. Number two, population for animals, it will work. Number three, population is for bacteria. In biology, it will work. Okay, under certain ideal assumptions, of course. Basically, you need to assume there are no limit on the environment to allow the population to grow. Otherwise, you know, they kill each other. They fight each other for resources. Okay. Third one, which you will see really quick, which is radioactive decay. Okay. I don't know if you guys heard about this. So let's say you have an element. It's carbon-14 or things like that. They're not stable. So as time goes, goes by, the mass degenerates. Okay. You start with 10 bond. after usually 5,000 years, let's say, you decay 5 pounds. You only have 5 pounds left. Okay. Now, if this thing decays at a fixed amount, that means 5,000 years corresponding to 5 pounds. You wait for another 5,000 years, this one should go to nothing. Which clearly, you cannot just put something there and eventually that thing is gone. Okay, It will never happen. So instead, they, grow, they decay at a rate. That is from here to here, you just decay by 50%. So from here to here, you decay by another 50% for 5,000 years, okay, which is only 2.5 pounds. You have this much left. So the fewer you have, the slower you decay because you're decaying at a fixed percentage. That is what we call uh, exponential decay. So it's very, very useful. Not limited to this, but it's already useful already. Okay. Um, that's what we have so far. No? We know why we study it. The third thing is, when we start a function, we want to see the properties. Okay. Several things. The first one is always domain. And range. Okay. Y equals A dot B X. What's the domain? What's the range? If you think it's hard to think about, give yourself some examples. Okay. What number can I put here? Can I put 3 to the 2? 3? 4? 1.5? 1,000? 10 million? So all positive numbers seems to be okay. Fraction is okay. What about 3 to the negative numbers? Negative 1, negative 2? It's just a reciprocal, so this is also okay. What about 3 to the 0? It's one, so it's also okay. So all together, the domain should be anything. Okay. What about the range? What kind of number can you produce? Well, let's think about it. Let's take uh, the general case. Y equals b to the x. Let's take examples 2 to the x. If x equals 1, you got 2. x equals 2, you got 4, 8 any number in between, it seems like you get you can get all the positive numbers starting from here, right? 2 to 0 give you 1, fine. 2 to the negative 1, does it give you something negative? Actually, no, it gives you 1 half. 2 to the negative 2, 1 fourth. You basically take all the numbers here, but you flip them. So eventually you can have something 1 over something really big, which is very close to 0, but not 0. With all that in mind, can you see what's going on here? You can basically take an exponential and produce any number which is positive from from this part. Okay. You cannot produce anything negative. You can produce any big number you want. You can produce any number that is very close to zero, which is one over two to the ten, two to the hundred, which will make it very, very small but never zero. Okay? That's domain and range. Second. This one always, always pass a number. That is, if you plug in zero, you should produce a dot b to the zero, and the b to the zero, no matter which b you put in, is going to be one. So, it always pass this number. Which basically is why this one is called initial value, right? That means when you plug in zero at the initial position, you got the initial number A. That is the principle. If you put in some principle into the bank, and what you get 
at the beginning of the first year, which means zero year, nothing change. You just got your principal. Okay. Now, according to this thing here and the thing we just computed, it's not hard to see this one has a horizontal asymptote. Okay, which is y equals zero. It will be very close to zero, but never touches zero because the range is from zero to infinity. Okay, with all that in mind, let's go draw the graph. Okay, for simplicity, let's take this one and let's only consider this one. Because when you multiply A, you basically just rescale it. We know how to do it. The harder part is how to draw this. If you think it's difficult, just think about y equals 2x and give yourself several points. If you plug in 2, so let's take x and you have 2 to the x. You plug in 0, you got 1. You plug in 2, you got 2 to the 1, which is 2. 4, you got 2 to the 4, which is 16. 2 to the 3 is 8. So actually, I should do plug in 1, you got 2. Plug in 2, you got 4. Plug in 3, you got 8. You see the trend, right? As your x become bigger and bigger, your y become bigger and bigger at a faster rate. So roughly, you start from 1, it goes up like this. If it's a fixed amount, 2, 4, 6, 8, it will be a line, right? So this one is a little bit faster than a line. Similarly, now let's plug in negative number. Negative y, you got 1 half. Negative 2, you got negative 1 over 4. Remember, you just flip everything, go saying. So as you move further and further to negative 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, your function value becomes smaller and smaller, but never touches zero. So, something like this. That will be the graph of an uh, exponential function. This is 1, if you take a to be 1. This will be a, if you just rescale it by a. Okay. Is that the only case? Of course not. We can think about a counterexample. That is 1 half to the x. Now if you draw the same table, you can see as your x become bigger and bigger, this one become 1 half, and the 1 half times 1 half which make it smaller. So this one you can try by yourself. But you can see this one give you exactly the opposite trend. The more you go to the right, the more 1 half you multiply, the smaller the value gets. But again, the horizontal asymptote touches zero. All right, so let's summarize. The graph has two possible cases. Okay, case one. If b is bigger than one, the more you multiply, the bigger it gets. This one should be increasing. Horizontal asymptote increasing at one. If b is less than one, and of course bigger than zero. Think about the one half and one third case. Then the more one half you multiply, the smaller this one gets. This one will be decreasing. So we have two type. It really depends on the numbers of B. If it's bigger or less than one. That's the second thing. All right. Now let's see some examples and try to compare how does this one affect. The first one we want to compare is what's the difference between this and this. It's very easy to draw one of them. This is 1, 0. This is y equals 2 to the x. Now let's draw this. Number one, this one still passes this point. Great. Now consider if you're plugging x, what's going to happen? At 1, you have 2 and 3. At a 2, you have 2 square and 3 square. 2 cube, 3 cube. You just keep going. Can you see that at any point, the red one will be bigger than the black one, which make it steeper? Okay, 
Similarly, if you have negative number, which means 2 to the negative 1, 2 to the negative 2, uh, 3 to the negative 1, this is 1 half, which is 1 third, and then this is 1 fourth, this is 1 three to the square, which is 1 ninth. You can see this one gives you a bigger number, but this bigger number now is at the bottom. So the red one should be smaller if you're taking the fractions. And that is the general principle of trying to draw the exponential functions. The bigger the base, the steeper it is. Okay. When we say steeper, we technically mean this one is above, is growing faster. Meanwhile, we know this one is actually going to decay faster, which makes it actually smaller. So a way to think about it is more like um, it's more like rotating this one counterclockwise. Then you will get the one which is in, in uh, with a bigger base, and the axis is exactly this point zero one. So take this thing, rotate it with respect to zero one, counterclockwise. That's the first one. Okay. Second, we have the other half. What if the graph looks like this? Right. So let's take an example. To see the relation between y equals 2 to the x and y equals 1 half x. We take them out, and the reason is because, of course, we know one graph goes like this, one goes like that, right? But the reason we take it out is because is because two and one half has the relationship. They are the same base. Except you need to take the negative one power of two in order to get one half. With that in mind, this become this. Become become this. Okay? So if you think about it, the relation between two to the x and the one half to the x is the same as two to the x and the two to the negative x. Or more precisely, it's between fx and f negative x. Now with what you have learned before uh, in college algebra, this means the graphs are symmetric with respect to the y-axis, or more precisely, if one looks like that, the other one looks like that. Exactly the same, but symmetric. Now, if we draw them together, it's fair to say, if you have this, then the other one will be exactly the same, but flip this one with respect to the y-axis. So, my drawing is not perfect. I think you know what I mean. They should look identical, except flipped. Okay, that's the relation between two to the x and one half x. That's the relation between 3x and 1 third x, and the 4x, 1 fourth x. As long as there one is the reciprocal of the other, you basically just flip everything. Now, combining what we have between 2 and 3, if we change the base, comparing what we have from 2 and 1 half, I will leave you something for you to think about. Question. Can you draw these two on the same coordinate system. And you need to think about which one is steeper. Okay, which one is, is it decreasing, is it increasing, which one is above, which one is below, on which part. Okay, so this is for you to think about. All right. Now let me check my notes. Uh, we covered exponential, we covered this graph. I think that will be everything we need. The last thing is for fun. Okay. 
Let me write it down. It's a simple fact. Exponential grows really fast. It dominates linear. It dominates square cube. Square looks pretty fast, but it's not as fast as exponential. Okay. An example I can give you is actually you can think about folding papers. Think about this. Okay. A paper is roughly 0.1 millimeter, which is uh, 0 0.01 centimeter, which is the same as uh, 0 0.0 10 to the negative 2, 10 to the negative 4 meter, which is 10 to the negative 7 kilometers. Roughly that thick. Okay. It's not much. Now, every time you fold it, you double the thickness. So you fold it for once, you got 0.2 millimeter. You fold, fold it for another time, you got 0.4 millimeter. You just keep going. Okay. Let's compute how thick this one can get. Okay, number one, fold it for 10 times. Okay, that's gonna be, you start from 0 0.01 centimeter. You times two, which is double, for 10 times. That roughly gives you 10.24 centimeter, which is roughly the size of your palm. Which is not much. Okay. You just keep folding it, and I calculate all these numbers ahead of time. So I can tell you it's 42 times. I'm going to use kilometer as unit because it gets bigger. Okay, so starting from here, do it for two, 42 times. What do we have? 10, 2z, negative 7. Multiply 2 to the 42 times. It gives you 43.9804 kilometer. If you just fold that thing for 42 times, which is not many times. Suppose it takes you one hour to vote them. That only takes you several days. Okay. Do you know how long that is? The distance from the Earth to the moon. Where is it? Ho, ho, ho. Distance. That's why. Is this much in mile? Is this much in kilometers? So if you fold it for 42 times, this is already bigger than from the Earth to the Moon. Okay. If you do it for 41 times, which is basically nine more times. Okay. You are receiving. Remember, you get doubled every time. So the bigger you get, the faster you grow. You double. You are looking at 225.179.981, okay. which is bigger than 1.6 dot, 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 dot kilometer. And this is actually the distance from the Earth to the sun. So another nine times starting from the Earth to the Moon, um, this one's going to be bigger than that. Now, finally, okay, I need to remember the number I calculated. I better look it, look it up. I think it's 103 times. Oh, no, it's here. It's 103 times. You can check by yourself. At here, it will be bigger than the diameter of 
the universe. So starting starting from a 0 0.01 centimeter, which is nothing but a paper, you fold it within a hundred times, you can beat the Earth to the sun and even a lot of galaxies and even just three more times than a hundred times, it's bigger than the diameter of the universe. That's how much this one is actually doubling, how fast exponential is growing. Okay. Now if you compare it to square, if you do 103 square, 03 square, you're roughly still at here, okay, which is not much. Exponential is way faster. Okay, think about it. Your population grows exponentially. So that's why we say, well, the exploding of, of population is scary. All right, that's everything we need for exponential functions.